our text today. We're going to start reading down in verse number 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want anything. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now, number eight, very famous verse. All right, people quote that, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. David saying, I found out that he's good. And he goes on to say in verse number nine, O oh, fear the Lord, all you saints, for there's no want in him. One of the things that makes him good is that when you're around him, you want for nothing. As we said, David wasn't afraid of Abimelech. He wasn't trusting in Abimelech. He didn't fear that Abimelech, if he had to depart from him, that he'd go hungry. He said, nope, I found out if you stick close to God, you'll want for nothing. That all your needs will be met. Those that just hang out around in his presence, there's no want. He's got so much, if you just hang around him, all your needs are going to be met. Okay, then, verse 10, the young lions do like and suffer hunger. Keep in mind, in the Middle East, mountain lions, yeah, not African lions, okay, but the lions that they had to deal with, the young ones, they're the ordinary ones. They don't have a pride. They don't have a den that's their own. Okay, and actually you study out lions, it's the male's job to protect the lions, the women do the hunting. So the young lion, as strong as he is, as powerful as his roar is, if he doesn't have a den, if he doesn't have somebody to go and go hunting for him, he's going to go hungry. He's lived his entire life fighting with other males trying to get stronger. He didn't learn how to go hunting. He didn't learn how to stalk prey through grass. Right? Like in the Lion King where, you know, Mufasa's trying to teach Simba. That doesn't happen in the real, real world. Right? The men don't learn how to stalk through the tall grass and then sneak up on the parrot and, you know, scare the crap out of it. Doesn't happen. Okay? What does happen is the boys, they fight. They learn how to protect. They learn how to overcome other lions. Right, but as young as he is, as strong as he is, right? Young lion, he's in his prime. Doesn't matter how strong he is, he doesn't know how to hunt. He suffers hunger. Until he can convince a lady lion that he's the strongest in the jungle, he's not eating. He's got to go out and do his own hunting. There's going to be days that he fails because he doesn't know how to do it. But, in contrast, they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Well, the Bible also says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want to find out how to have a great life, David's saying you've got to start by fearing the Lord. He says, I may not know everything. I do know how to reverence God. I mean, how many psalms do we have where he writes to his praise? How many psalms do we have that he writes to honor God? He's saying, I was in a low place, but God's still God. Right? His life wasn't perfect, but he was a man after God's own heart. He's saying, come close, and I'll show you how to reverence God. And as a result, you'll too see that the Lord is good. But, back to verse number 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Anybody ever order something off of the menu that had a picture? You think, man, that looks good. And then you taste it, and it's awful. That ever happened to you? Usually it happens to me with mushrooms. I don't like mushrooms. They say, well, there's no taste to mushrooms. Hogwash. I know when there's mushrooms in something. Now, I don't even need You could blindfold me. I know if there's mushrooms in it, Brother Jake. Don't like them. At the same time, not a big fan of tomatoes. Right? I mean, I'll eat them if I'm in the mood for them. Not a big fan. Well, for Thanksgiving, I made appetizers. Okay? Not a tomato guy, but she made some prosciutto. Th it had tomatoes in it. Couldn't taste the tomatoes. It was pretty good. It was delicious. I ate about 12 of them things. And that was before the regular meal. I was like, I don't know what this is, but it's good. And I don't care that it's got tomatoes in it. Right? If we make the surface level judgments, well, hey, that's got tomatoes on it. I don't want to eat it. 
Well, you may be missing out on a good thing. And just because it appeals to your eyes doesn't mean that when you taste it, it's actually good. Now, the proof is in not what it looks like, not in what you can you know, compare it to. That's how people used to live in a while. Well, this kind of looks like a blueberry, but then again, it doesn't really look like a blueberry. Now, this may look like a cherry. It's just a little bit darker. Well, that could be a wild cherry tree. Don't eat that. That's bad. We used to have one in the backyard. Mom and Dad had to make it very plain to Christian not to eat the cherries in the backyard. Why? Because they would do them harm. But they looked a whole lot like regular cherries. Right? The proof is not in what you can compare, what your reference is. Oh, I had something that looked like that once, and it was pretty good. Well, maybe it was pretty good because of the person that made it, not because of what the dish was. I don't care who you are. No offense, ladies. You can make all the chocolate chip cookies you want to. You're not going to beat my mom's. It may look better. I mean, they're not little like pristine. You put them in the front window of the bakery shop and all the, the chocolate chips are perfect and everything. No, not like that. But they taste better than anything else I've ever had. What did you say? I've stopped trying other people's chocolate chip cookies. I've tasted and I know that mom's is good. Right? And everybody else that usually has them says, they're pretty good. Yeah, I know. Leave, leave them down back there. Man, they're good. But they don't last around the house very long. The longest that they last, it, sometimes I can restrain myself and say, okay, no, we're not going to eat all of them because other people in the house haven't had an opportunity to eat them. So the longest that they'll last is breakfast the next day because if there's still a bunch left, I know what I'm having for breakfast. You say, it's not healthy. It's good. What's the point? You can't judge on the outward. He's altogether lovely. But Lucifer himself can be transformed into an angel of light. You say, well, he was a lamb without spot and without blemish. Yeah, and there's a lot of sheep out there that people are spray painting to cover up blemishes, to cover up dark spots in their wool. Right? That they're making sure you only see it walk on one side because it may have a limp on the other side. There are a lot of things that people in the world can do to persuade you that what you're looking at is good. But the proof is in the taste. So as I was mulling over this ever since about Wednesday night first point is something that got out of the message on Wednesday night but as I'm mulling over this thought of chief so this morning we're just going to teach on our God's good the chief thanks the Lord Lord thank you for being a good God well what does that word good mean right well let's look at the marriage of Cana for instance the parties master the owners you know they're at the wedding well the man who owned the house he said why did we save the best for last what made the last wine the best wine it was the newest right it hadn't been firm it hadn't started rotting yet well what's good about grape juice it's sweet it's refreshing right when you see taste and see that the Lord is good well, the Lord is sweet. One of the things that make it, I mean, we're not going to get through all the things that make him good. But one of the definitions of good is it's the best. Well, what made that grape juice so great? Well, it was sweet. Well, as our pastor was in the middle of teaching on the Lord's Supper, I already shared this with Brother Phil. He liked it. Right? We know that the bread in the Lord's Supper bitter. Right, to remind us of the cost of our sin. Right, that's what he said. But then, the grape juice is sweet. And Jesus said that this is a picture of his blood. And he said, this do in remembrance of me. Well, see, Jesus' blood was sweet. Anybody ever bite the inside of your lip? I got cut right about here where, because of my big old jaws, I bit into something the other day and caught a piece of my cheek. Right? Started bleeding. You know what my blood tastes like? It's got that metallic taste. Anybody else ever have that happen? You get something, you know, caught in your gum, you're trying to dig it out, next thing you know, you're tasting metal. Right? Our blood is not sweet. You know why our blood's not sweet? Because of sin. That met that metallic taste, it's because sin had us in bondage. Our blood only put chains on us. Our blood is bitter it's 
It's got that metallic. That it reminds us that we are not perfect. But see, he was without sin. His blood was sweet because it was undefiled. It was uncursed. But those that get to Calvary and have the blood applied to their life, they taste and see that the Lord is good because the Lord is sweet. His blood brought forgiveness. His blood purged, which means not just covered it, took it away, the sins of our life. His blood does not decay. If I bleed and, God forbid, I get it on the pulpit, here in a little bit, it's going to dry. Here in a little bit, it's going to be a stain. His has never dried out. He entered in once into the holy place to put His blood on the altar on the mercy seat of heaven right because his is undefiled his is everlasting our hope is in the fact that the blood was applied if the blood dried out it would have to be reapplied if the blood dried out he may have to die another death but no because he was undefiled because his blood was good it was the best it doesn't dry out right it's still on the mercy seat today that's why he told Mary not to touch him because he hadn't yet. He had to be spotless, blameless to put that blood on the mercy seat. Boy, it's still there. If it's been applied to your life, it's still there. But that thinking of, well, of course my blood tastes like metal. Wages of sin is death. Right? He came to break chains. What chains? The chains of sin. My flesh isn't saved. It's still got the chains of sin in it. My blood, not saved. Still got sin in it. But his was applied. It's still just as sweet today. You go back and start thinking about where he found you and where he put you. It's still sweet. I mean, what he did on the cross, what he had to suffer was bitter. Right? My sin caused him to go through all those horrific things, but the product that it brought forth was sweet. That's just something I was thinking about, Brother Mike. One of them thoughts that Jordan has that ends up being a point in Sunday school. Right, ours, chains, metal cages. Sin keeps us bound, but His set us free. Right, well, not the only definition of good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But what else does good mean? Good can mean sweet. Good can mean the best. You already alluded to that. Well, taste and see that the Lord's kinship is the best. It's good. He's a friend that's taking it closer than a brother. But he's not just our friend. We're joint heirs with him. We've received the adoption of sonship. We're in the family of God. We're not a friend of God. Although that's what was said of Moses. Well, one day Moses got into the family of God. When Jesus went and led captivity captive in Abraham's bosom the blood was applied to his life he's in the family right when you got saved not only were you forgiven of sins there was a royal decree somewhere up in heaven that was signed in the blood of Christ that said this one is part of the family now you got adopted right there is a fr I believe that God will give you a friend here in earth some friends that will be closer to you than blood relatives. Right? But he also promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Well, that's closer than a brother. Right? There's a friend that sticks us closer than a brother, but as close as that one can get you, they're going to have to leave you at some point. I'm not sharing a bed with somebody. Right? I've got enough problems you know, with kicking around and nerve pain and everything else. I need the whole bed right now. Okay? I wake up in weird positions sometimes. Not going to happen. You may be my best friend. You're, you're leaving me at some point because I can't stand people that long. Right? It gets on my nerves. People wonder why I live in a bunker because there's no people. It's great. I choose when people. People not all the time. Right? And just not the way I'm wired. But Christ, and didn't say you'd be your friend. He said, everything I own, you own. Joint heirs. 
you were adopted through the doctrine of the kinsman redeemer because there were those in Christ's lineage Rahab and Ruth that one Moabites and the other one Jericho what that do pretty much covers all the Gentiles and you know what that means because there was a Gentile in Christ's lineage he could redeem the wrongdoing of those that were Gentiles because somewhere you could trace it back and you could say that right there is my end to the family of God one accident one chance is designed that way so that Christ could say I can adopt anyone into the family of God that the father could say there's forgiveness for all because he loved all right but once we're in the family his kinship second to none so many Christians live so far below their station because they don't understand all the privileges that are afforded to them as a child of God we're so caught up in the mundane and with the day to day because we don't cast all our cares upon him that we live so far below our privilege do you understand that at any time day or night doesn't matter what else is going on in the world you can enter directly into the throne room of God you're not just praying well Lord make something happen no 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 in the eyes of God you're standing before the one that said let there be light and it happened that he flung everything out on nothing the one that holds the very breath that you're breathing in his hand that sits on the throne that the Bible says is in the sides of the north you're at the highest place in all of existence right below the throne of God and he hears you why? because of what his son did because you were adopted children always have access to the father an outsider no but because of our kinship I can speak directly to God don't have to go through somebody else don't have to send it through an angel don't have to write a letter drop it in the post office and hopes it gets to the North Pole right instantaneously in fact you know the Bible says that the Spirit takes those groanings and utterances that we can't to, I believe that sometimes before you even speak it in your heart you've already said it Holy Ghost beat you there even when in ignorance you ask amiss the Holy Ghost might be asking just what's right he said because they're weak because his flesh is still sin cursed I'm going to give them someone to relay what really is in their heart because sometimes they might not even know you understand that Jesus Christ himself sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you not a second has gone by since you've got saved that Jesus wasn't praying for you to the Father. That's sweet. That's good. Right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. You didn't know that when you got saved. But in hindsight, looking back at all the times that we were idiotic or the times that we were too caught up with what was going on around us in the world, I'm thankful that the Son was praying to the Father on my behalf. I'm thankful that he's given angels charge over us but my hope's not in the angel my hope's in him right? I'm, I'm thankful for the fact that he doesn't just have an associate he indwells me I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit start reading your Bible and look at all the different names for the Holy Ghost throughout the Bible you're going to find the Spirit of Jesus Christ you're going to find the Spirit of Jesus talking about the Holy Ghost because they are one and the same Father, Son, Spirit all of them one why, why do you think he could tell you that he'd never leave you nor forsake you because he's going every step of the way with you that's good I don't know if you guys are like me but you guys ever just like get tunnel vision on something that's all you can think about and then next thing you know the Holy Ghost will say hey whoa back up a sec you forgot to do this or hey before you go and do that go and do this 
hey, just take a second, pull off this exit, get some gas. I got half a tank, Lord. Get gas. Okay. Anybody else like that? But then right around the corner, or just at that moment, somebody comes in and the Lord says, hey, hang them a track. I'd have blown right past them. Too caught up in what I was doing. Right? The Holy Ghost is not just a friend. He's not just kin. He is my guide. Yes, we're supposed to use this as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. But the Word is spiritually discerned. He's the one shining the light. He's the one saying, hey, look here. That's what you need to do. Hey, you asked the Lord what the will of God was for your life. Here it is. Look at where I'm shining the light. He is the one that not only explains God's Word to us, not only is He the one that throws up those flags, He is the one that convinces us and gives us security. Yeah, that's what conviction means. Convince. Okay, well, when you say, or if somebody comes up to you, are you worried about this? No. Why? I've got peace. Why? Because God settled that in my heart. You know what that means? Because the Holy Ghost convinced you or convicted you that it was true, He settled it in your heart. My hope is not built on my ability to understand the Word of God. My hope is built on what God said, what He did, and Him convincing me of it so that I'm not worried about it no more. I can convince you of something. In fact, Sister Janet, bless her heart, love her to death. I could convince this Sister Janet that all the roads are going to be painted green tomorrow and she'd believe me. But she just trusts me that much. I could convince her of that. Only tomorrow, roads wouldn't be green. I convinced her for a moment, but somebody else smarter than me, right? More fluent in speech than me. Somebody that might be more likable than me. That's not hard. Somebody that may come in and be able to tickle your ears better than somebody else. Now, they can convince you of something. But if man convinced you, man can unconvince you. My faith is not built on what I can understand. It's what God's proven to me through the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a friend that's taking it closer than a friend, but that's one that doesn't leave you nor forsake you. Do you understand that he underwent the pain of being forsaken so that he could promise you that you'll never be alone when the father broke fellowship with the son on the cross the son was alone nobody in hell wanted anything to do with him they thought they had won they said hey we killed him wrong they laid down his life but they thought that they did it Nobody in heaven could talk to him because he was bearing the sins of all humanity. Father had to break fellowship with him because the Father cannot be associated with sin. And for three days and three nights, he was utterly alone. But when he rose victorious, he promised you, you'll never have to go through what I went through. Doesn't matter how dark, doesn't matter how painful, doesn't matter how much you think that nobody cares. I'll be there with you. Daniel and the lion's den, he went in alone, but he found out that the angel of the Lord was there. There's a time that Daniel was alone. Them three Hebrew boys, they were saying, we're standing together, but they got tied up alone. They got thrown into the fiery furnace alone. And then once they got in there, they found out that there was someone waiting on them. But there's a time that they were alone. There were times that David in caves, as much as he wanted to be heart to heart with God, David still had sin. God couldn't indwell him yet. In fact, in the Old Testament, you'll find that sometimes the Spirit of the Lord would overshadow people. Right? That it would be over them, but not in them. They were close, but there were times that David was still alone. He didn't have the Holy Ghost to bring Bible verses back to his mind that would comfort him. He was relying just on holding on as hard as he could to the Word of God. Believing that God would do what He promised to do. 
we're on the other end of that we get to reap all of those promises that were given and have been fulfilled so those nights when you can't sleep or your eyes are closed but inwardly you know all the lights are still on and you're sitting there and you're wondering how this is going to happen or that's going to happen and a bible verse comes to mind it's because he said I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee and it's one thing just to have somebody read you a bible verse it's another thing when the Holy Ghost says hey you remember this verse and he starts walking you through it and you start thinking about it and little by little he starts convincing you that not only is it, tr- is it true that's what's going to happen in your life you can go to bed easy that night why because I didn't figure it out I didn't convince myself that it was something true no God settled it I've got peace without the Holy Ghost you wouldn't have peace because my peace is not contingent on me it's contingent on believing that he is who he said he was man's a fickle thing man can be tossed about with every wind of doctrine you know why that happens because the Holy Ghost didn't cement the doctrine in their life they didn't allow the Holy Ghost to convict them of what was true some people they, whatever the preacher said well that must be true well does it line up with what God said I mean, some people, even well-intentioned, will teach you a lie because they think it's true. Man can convince you of many things, but there's one person that can convince you, and it doesn't matter what comes. It doesn't matter if the, you know, the depths of the deep are broken up and if some tsunami's headed towards Kentucky. Right? Who would have thought that would have ever happen? Okay. God knew it was going to happen. God got me to the place that I am right now. If I'm in the will of God, this is where God wanted me. I'm okay. He'll either bring me through it or I'll get to see him today to be, be absent with the body, be present with the Lord. He'll figure it out. It'll be okay. In the meanwhile, if there's a tsunami coming, maybe the Lord's going to give me an opportunity to witness somebody. Can't be focused on me. He's got me in the palm of his hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. I'm good but others may not be now you want to know why Moses was able to say stand still and see the salvation of the Lord because he believed that the Lord was going to send salvation you know why he was convinced of that because God told him he heard God's audible voice tell him tell him and he said okay he got up on the mountain and he got to see the first bit of the law penned down he's saying oh this, this is God's holiness written out because God's never done any of the things that he said thou shalt not do that's why when Christ came he had perfect sweet blood because his wasn't tainted by sin he didn't break the law and he's sitting there and he's looking and he's saying this is the holiness and he's understanding I don't do this I am not holy he saw God's very finger right into the stone and then here's just something for you while we're here the Bible says that the Ten Commandments, it was written through on both sides. You know what that means? It means that on one side you held it up and it was carved all the way through what it was supposed to say. Well, if you flipped it over, you'd think, well, it'd just be the opposite of that. No. When you flipped it over, it is something different. Because God wrote it with his own finger. He saw that happen. And all the while he's thinking, Lord, I'm so unworthy to even be here because I've done these things the first ten that he got what was one of them thou shalt not kill he's already guilty of that he killed an Egyptian and tried to hide it but somebody already found it out that's why he ended up on the backside of a mountain in Midian right even back then they didn't have the Holy Ghost but some of them saw enough that they had faith so if they had such great faith without all the benefits that we have how much more should we have because we have the goodness of the Holy Ghost he's not just good as Tony the Tiger said he's great our God is an awesome God he's a magnificent God he's a wonderful God he's a loving God he's a jealous God he's an angry God he's angry at the wicked every day but he's also a long suffering God 
There's so many different things that we can talk about on how God's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But again, you know what the contingency is? Taste. How many benefits or blessings or privileges do we miss out on because we're not willing to say, okay, Lord, get me in your word. Knock off the rough edges so that I can get to the point that I can taste what's next. I can tell you all the things that God's promised you, but if you're not positioned to receive them, you're not going to get them. In fact, yeah, Friday night, I went over, babysat Chief, because they went down to her parents' house for Thanksgiving. Christian had to work, and her dog has anxiety issues. He doesn't like being alone. Okay, well, I let Chief outside at one point. I keep hearing this drip, drip, drip. The hose was still on in the back. And the head wasn't tied on all that good, so it was dripping. Okay? But at some point, I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. But I inferred at some point something needed to get wet, and that's why the hose was turned on. Okay? But now this water was being wasted somewhere where they didn't want it. God doesn't waste His blessings. There's no spot that you can get to and say, although I've been living like I've wanted to live, at least I can still get a few drops over here. Uh, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that, you know, maybe if I just hang around the things that God, I might get a little bit of, you know, somebody does a cannonball in the goodness of God, I might get a little wet. It's not how it happens. You have to personally say, Lord, I submit, but now, Lord, instruct me. School me so that I can get further and taste more and more of your goodness. How many times has our pastor preached on that Christian life is not just an upward climb? It's plateaus. Right, a plateau, it goes up and then it's flat. And it goes up and then it's flat. And then up and up and up. You know why it's flat? For me to learn what I need to get up the next hill. But at the top of the next hill, there's something new to taste. That taste is to prove to me that, hey, you got another hill coming, but I'm going to be enough to get you up the hill. Because I know I can't climb it, but he can climb it up, you know, climb up it for me. I mean, how about God's burden is good? Right? His yoke is easy. His burden is light. My burden, all the worries of my life, it'll cripple me. How many people are on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication? Right? One, their flesh is cursed. There are people that have imbalances that they can't help it. But some people are just so stressed out because they don't know what to do in their life that it's tearing them apart from the inside out. Their brain can't handle how complex their life is. I'm thankful that there's one that's already got my life figured out. He knew what my life would be before he even created the earth. And I know in the beginning was the heaven and the earth. Well, you say, when did he make heaven and earth? I don't know. It was before the beginning. Back in the alpha of time. But all the way back then, he saw me. And he said, his life's going to be a mess. And unless we come up with a plan, he's going to die and go to hell. That's why he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Because the plan was designed long before creation ever happened. And then it was executed some 2,020 years ago, give or take. And then, today it is manifest in us, believers. But see, it's not manifest if we don't taste. Because if I don't taste, Brother Mike, I don't know. You ever try to convince somebody of something that you don't know? Pretty hard. I was pretty good at it, though, back in the day debating. If everybody wanted to argue one side, I'd let them get up and just give speech after speech of repetitive stuff. And then finally, I'd stand up on the other side, and I'd just destroy it. Maybe because I'm a megalomaniac. But I like doing it. I'm like, okay, y'all want to be on one side? Let's do this. I'll take y'all on. Right, it was a challenge. It was something fun. But I didn't believe it. I was doing it to win. There are many times that, you know, you'd get up and there'd be something stupid on there. 
Like, we want recess to be an hour long every day. I don't care. But if I've got some scientist in the briefcase that says an hour exercise a day would help improve mental health and it would help improve physical health, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I don't believe it, but I'm going to try and convince these people of it. Well, in your life, people know whether or not you believe what you're actually saying. They know if you're convinced. They know if you've got what the old-timey word was gumption. They know whether or not you walk like you actually know what you're talking about. People that have, are confident in what they're believing in, they're, they're not, you know, frail and I don't, mm, mm, no wish. They'll stand up and they'll tell you what they think and they won't apologize for it. Because in their life, it's absolute truth. You know why Christianity has become victim to imitators and perversions and everything else? Because at some point along the way, people stop, there was one comedian said, saying it with their chest saying, hey, this is what I believe, boldly, proudly, emphatically. That didn't come from them. The Bible talks about that Stephen, Peter, the Apostle Paul, all these people when questioned or when brought before someone, that Holy Ghost unction would fall upon them and their words would have greater impact than just somebody talking. You know why that happened? Because they were convinced of it and as a reward of their faithfulness, God poured out unction, poured out power, poured out that impact to their words. It wasn't what they did. It was that they were convinced of it, and they were going to face whatever came their way. So God empowered them to overcome it. And as a result, many people saw it and said, that person actually believes what they're saying. That person lives like what they're saying is true. We're written epistles. People know whether what we say is important to us or not. People know whether or not what we claim to believe, if that actually manifests in our life. If I'm not convinced of it, why would somebody else, if they tasted the fruit in my life, why would they be convinced of it? I mean, we read it last week. The Lord said that He is the true vine. And anyone in Him will bear much fruit because the true vine is the good vine I mean taste and see that the Lord is good the reason his fruit's good is because he's the true vine all the other vines are imitators but if we get grafted into the vine then we'll have good fruit well the Bible did say that there were some branches that were attached to them but they were dead they didn't have fruit they weren't convinced that they were where they needed to be. The Bible said that they were meant only to be cast off and thrown into the fire. How many Christians are just barely hanging on saying, Lord, I think this is where I'm supposed to be? Well, how about you get a good taste of how good He is and you just get hooked up to the vine because then you'll become alive. You know, I don't know why I just saw this, Brother Randy, but I was... Sister Kathy asked me one time, hey, you know any fruit that could like symbolize the process of salvation? No, nah, but I, I can Google real quick. So I was sitting out there in one of them brown chairs after church one night, and we were looking through different fruits and everything. There's a type of orange called the Napoleon orange. I think that's what it was, or Napoleonic orange, something like that. Okay. Very, very strange orange. Because I don't know where the first one came from, but the, that tree, it doesn't bear seeds. It cannot make another tree like every other tree does. Napoleonic one doesn't have any seeds in it. So if the fruit were to fall to the ground, there's no seed, you can't sprout another tree. Well, you say, well, how in the world do you get another Napoleonic orange tree? Well, I'll tell you. After that tree gets so big and the roots are very massive, what you do is, is you find one that's close to the surface. You cut away the outer part of the root and you get in and you take out the center soft part of the root. Then you go over to a different orange tree. Regular old orange tree. You cut one of its roots open, put that soft part from the other one into it, then close it back up. And eventually what happens is that Napoleonic orange root that you plant it into a regular tree, it'll take over the root system of the other tree. 
And then it'll work its way up into the fruit. And eventually, now that's got Napoleonic oranges, but that one doesn't have seeds either. Right? We were not birthed as a result of the fruit of somebody else's life. We were birthed because God took himself and put himself in us. And as a result, I need to say, here's my fruit. Doesn't have any seeds in it. Because I don't have what you're looking for. But it's evidence that taste, I got this from the one that birthed me. Taste and see that it's good. And when they say, well, how do I get it? There's no seeds. How do I, how do I get this in my life? He needs to do to you what he did to me. Well, what did he do? Really? Can't tell you. Don't really understand it all that well, but whatever he did, it was good. And I know that he's still there today. I know that he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart. Kind of hard for somebody to tell you that God's not real when He's speaking to me throughout the day. How's that happen? You taste. And then because of the taste, you're convinced. Maybe some of us have just gotten to the point that we go up to the buffet of the goodness of God. It's endless. You can never exhaust it. And we've got the things that we like. And well, I'll, I'll go to church this week, put that on our plate. I'll read a few devotions this week, put that on our plate. But how come, whatever point in Christ, why do some people think, well, I don't need to keep tasting? Why, do you not like good things? Dad can say he hates Chinese food all he wants to. It's good. I eat it. He doesn't like it when I eat it because he says it stinks up the whole house. But when I'm eating Chinese food, other people know about it. And when I say, hey, what is that? It's good. Come down and eat it. Matter of people say, why do you eat all the seafood? Because it's good. Seafood's good. Why do you go through all the work to eat a crab leg? Because what's on the inside is good. And I've got it down to an art. I don't even need the crackers and none of that stuff. Just good. There's a little bit of effort, but if you put in the effort, what you get is good. If you let him do the work in you, you're convinced that there's more good out there. Those that make a difference for Christ are not those that understand much. In fact, they're usually those that know that they'll never be able to exhaust the fullness and the goodness of God. They'll never be able to understand it. Half of it's not even been told. How are you going to figure it all out? But they do understand everything he's done is good. And they just keep going from goodness to goodness. Living for God. Convinced that tomorrow he'll still be good. Convinced that, well, if he asks me to do it, it's because he wants to be good to somebody else. So it doesn't matter how much it may pain my flesh or how much in the world they may look at me and say, I'm missing out. No, because what I've got is good. Taste and see. Keep tasting. Don't go on a diet. That's one of them things that doesn't matter how, how much you get in here, you're still going to find something good. Don't over it. If you try to figure out how good God is, your brain's going to melt. Don't try and do that. Don't try and figure out how long eternity is. I've, I've worked on that one for a while. Uh, yeah. Every now and then, I just get to a point in my brain say, I give up. Every now and then, it scares the tar out of my flesh. You know why? Because the flesh realizes it's going to the grave for all of eternity. But at the same time, my soul's just rejoicing. He's like, what? why'd you stop thinking about that? Because I realized it really didn't matter. What matters is today. I can taste and see that the Lord's good today. I can also offer to others that say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because this isn't my fruit. My fruit had seeds in it. It was sour. right? It was had citrusy flavor. This is different. You may think you know what it is, but it's new. Different. And it didn't come from me. But how do you get that? He's got to be in you. And able to grow all throughout you. Because if we keep them in the roots, it's never getting to the fruit. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.